It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. Welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Uh, some new some new numbers out on our billionaire class. Evidently, globally, we've got uh, 2,781 billionaires, and thank goodness we do the most ever. So, hey, globally, number one. Most billionaires ever. Congratulations. Also, also here in the U.S., uh, 800 of those billionaires uh, right here in our backyard. And again, number one, uh, thank you, American workforce, for sacrificing uh, wages and benefits and retirement security and vacations and time with your family. Thank you for that. Our billionaires are forever grateful. Uh, but here at home, our billionaires control about $5.8 trillion in wealth which uh, the, the, the statistic I saw, weird, uh, is evidently 50% more wealth than 50% of the country. So the bottom half of the country has about $3.7 trillion worth of wealth. Our 800 billionaires, $5.8 trillion. Look, you can fit 800 people into a good size room. 65 million households, um, there's some unequal distribution here. There's a problem. But I guess the, the positive part of this is that 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 idiotic nonsense that, you know, you just work hard, play by the rules kind of thing, uh, that's out the window. Because what we find out, uh, the new billionaires, the, the billionaires under 30, not one of them have done it on their own. Not one of them pulled their self up by the bootstraps. Not one of them did work, invented something. No, no. All of the billionaires now under 30, the new ones, the newly minted billionaires, uh, they got their money the old fashioned way. They inherited it. Uh, someone died and they cashed in, won the birth lottery. And look, good for them. Uh, but what this is, is quite frankly, this is congratulations, uh, conservatives, congratulations, uh, the anti tax crusaders in the GOP and on the right, because, well, as a generation who has benefited from massive tax breaks uh, that you know we gave out willingly, again, through lower wages, health care benefits, all that stuff. Now they get to pass that wealth on to the next generation with virtually no tax burden whatsoever. And you go, um, mission accomplished, I guess. Uh, should we take some joy in knowing that our sacrifices uh, being, you know, I guess, recognized? I don't know about appreciated, but recognized because we, we're we number one. We've got the most billionaires of everywhere. And the fact that none of the global billionaires under 30 actually produced anything, I guess that, that, that you know, you work hard, you know, thing, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I, I guess that's now out the window. You know, you know, squeeze the quarter till the till the eagle screams. You know, scrimp and save, and you'll be a billionaire too, kind of thing. Um, is this where we as working people go? Yeah, chances of us being a billionaire, uh, zero, and or or zero, and a whole bunch of zeros uh, after the decimal point, and then a whole bunch of zeros more, and then one, well down the road. Uh, now look at March. March we had a very good job report. Uh, 303,000 jobs created in the month of March. Uh, solid. Uh, that would take us to somewhere over the last year, almost 3 million jobs created during the Biden year here so far. Unemployment ticked down to 3.8%. In fact, uh, we have been under 4% for 26 consecutive months, uh, about to break the record. Uh, we are one shy of the record uh, that was set back in the 1960s for being under 4%. That is a good thing. Hourly wages up 4.1% over the same rate last year. So wages are ticking up, uh, maybe not uh, keeping up with inflation as they should, but that's been decades in the making. 
Uh, look, this is not new. This is Reagan firing the Patco workers, firing that shot across the boardroom, saying, hey, it's open season on those greedy unions and their demands for better wages. And look, look what it's done. All these years later, stagnant and declining wages. Uh, but good jobs report, uh, happy jobs report. Uh, in the healthcare industry, they added 72,000 jobs. Good. Uh, but I guess you know more of us are getting sick. Construction, we're seeing the investments that the Biden folks and the Democrats and a couple of Republicans threw in actually bearing fruit. 39,000 jobs there. People are going back to restaurants again. Those are firing back up. 31,500 jobs created. Uh, and that is a good thing. Government even. Uh, you're starting to see the roles increasing, uh, especially on the local level, where 49,000 of the 71,000 government jobs uh, were brought back. And, and that's a good thing. Look, services are coming back. Uh, the idea that maybe we can fix neighborhoods and, and actually do something. Sadly, manufacturing has been flat, uh, but the auto industry did add 6,500 jobs. That's, that's a good thing. Uh, sadly, uh, the the share of people holding multiple jobs that rose to five point four percent, still below the '90s peak. Uh, but you know, every time I see this this comment, this phrase of you know how many people are holding two, three, four, five jobs, I can't help but think of George W. Bush during one of the uh, town halls he did, where a woman stood up and said, "You know, I work three jobs," and she's about ready to tell the story of how difficult her life is and how she she can't make it on one or two jobs. She needs three to be able to put food on the table, a roof over the head, medicine in her cabinet. Uh, and he cuts her right off, goes, wow, uniquely American. Good for you. Good for you working three jobs just to exist. And, and I'll tell you, nothing really hammers that point home than more than that, that statement. And that's been the Republican position for a while. Good on you. You go out there and you work you work, 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 because someday you might be a billionaire if you just work hard enough. And you go, um, I think we're we're missing the point here. Uh, the, the folks having multiple jobs, working more hours. In fact, the number of hours worked by Americans ticked up a bit as well uh, in the month of March, meaning we're working harder, making a little bit more, but sadly still falling behind. And this is where I come back to the game seems already rigged for most Americans, and sadly so. That work hard, play by the rules, get ahead thing, I firmly believe in and I want, and you should too. But I look at, you know, November, and I look at the guys who are running for president. One guy uh, says, hey, you know, rich people need to pay taxes. Uh, we want workers to join and form unions. We want uh, the, the share of the economy that workers create the wealth that they create to go some of that to them. And the other guy, Donald Trump, uh, over the weekend at a, what he claims is a $50 million fundraiser full of billionaires and rich people lining his pockets. Uh, he promised them that he wasn't going to raise their taxes and they would be just fine. Got to keep those taxes low for you folks. You know, the hoarders, the greed monsters, the ones who are going to pass on to your children uh, trillions of dollars in wealth. And that's going to happen. And, you know, you go back to the first person who paid the estate tax, uh, John D. Rockefeller, was the the first person who, by any, by any uh, measure, was a billionaire of his time. He was the, the richest guy probably almost ever. Uh, he paid a 70% estate tax. Uh, when he and, 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 and when he passed, seventy percent. And what's interesting is you still have rich Rockefellers today. Uh, they 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 did okay. But with, now what do we have? Well, we've got crumbling infrastructure, sadly, because we're not investing enough. And but good on look, good on Biden for what we got. We need to triple what we got, and we need more. Um, the money that we're reshoring factories with, the education system, the healthcare, all of these things that we need to address. We're giving away to our very well-to-do so that we can have the bragging rights to say, hey, we've got the most billionaires. So do you take great pride in knowing that we here in the great U.S. of A 
uh, with you know that where we just doubled the po- child poverty rates, uh, where you have veterans sleeping in the streets, where homelessness is still a problem, but we've got billionaires, and we've got lots of them. In fact, so many of them, eight hundred, uh, that they have so much wealth, fifty percent more than half of this country. I guess good on us. Hooray for us! Is that is that what we should be doing? Uh, now, look, I think it's a good jobs report. Uh, this administration has been doing everything it can do to clean up uh, from Trump's pandemic mess. Uh, I we're heading in the right direction. But the, the the folks on the other side still whining, and recession's coming, the sky's falling. I'm uh, don't buy it. Uh, when we come back and talk about the latest attempt by big money to destroy your ability to get better wages, hours, conditions. Quick break. Right back. From the steel mills of Pennsylvania to the auto factories of Michigan to the modern makers movement, manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good-paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America. The old factory towns in America's heartland have been taking a beating. Thing is, though, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. The Inflation Reduction Act will lower energy prices and create millions of new jobs by dramatically increasing the manufacturing of solar panels, wind turbines, electric cars, and energy efficient home appliances. We're finally turning things around after 40 years of screwing over working people. But will we keep moving in the right direction? That's our choice as Americans. So every day we're seeing stories of workers fighting to organize and achieve union representation on the job, demanding better wages, hours, working conditions, you know, um, especially coming out of the the pandemic. Not surprising. Uh, We were told we were frontline heroes. We're essential. You remember. Uh, And workers have internalized it. And you know what? They would like to make better wages. Uh, So as workers are organizing, Corporate America, not not thrilled that the pendulum is swinging just a little bit back in the direction of maybe having to share some of those profits, which is why corporate America decided, hey, maybe there's a new tact here. Maybe we can go after the very law that gives workers those little bit of rights to help them organize the National Labor Relations Act, which has been decided law since 1935, 89 years. And well, you've got companies like SpaceX, Amazon, Starbucks, Trader Joe's all going, hey, how can we get this in front of the Supreme Court? You know, the one that threw out Janice, overturned Roe, you know, the one where John Roberts was going to be the guy who called balls and strikes. How can they get that there? And here to share some thoughts on, well, what it would look like if they were successful in making the 89-year-old law unconstitutional. That's why I've asked Tom Spiggle to come talk with us. He's an employment lawyer and host of the Spiggle Law Firm podcast. You can find that wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Tom, thanks for taking time for us. I'm happy to be here, Rick. Great topic. So this uh, this very predictable. I mean, you, you can't intimidate people much anymore. The captive audience, audience meetings seem to be going away. People are standing up for themselves. People have internalized that whole hero thing. Uh, now corporate America has got to find a new way to, to put workers down and, and crush their rights to organize. This seems very predictable to me. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this has been a long, you know, longstanding tactic of corporate America to try to fight any kind of regulatory apparatus. And, uh, you know, one of their favorites is to, uh, to, to fight back against agencies like the SEC and now the, the National Labor Relations Board. So, this is a very common uh, tactic in their playbook. But you know, here's the thing. I, I remember John Roberts, and then we're going to talk about the Supreme Court for a second, because I remember John Roberts' confirmation. He's going to call balls and strikes. Decided law was decided law, and this court has been well willing to just tear up decided law and make new law out of whole, whole cloth. Do you see this as a possibility that they could overturn an 89-year-old law? You know, it's hard to predict, as you point out, what this particular Supreme Court will do, given the 
you know, the, the, the new makeup of it. I, I think this is a bit of a long shot, but you never know. I mean, this is a, again, kind of a tried and true tactic where they come through Texas, right? They filed the lawsuit in Texas. They want to get to the fifth circuit court of appeals, which has a pronounced rightward tilt and then get that before the Supreme court. And we've had a number of, you know, we've seen that, we've seen that path already. Certainly, um, uh, with, uh, with the, you know, with the abortion drug, we would recently have oral arguments on that. Uh, it, we'll see what the Supreme court does with that objective. Um, so I don't know if I were a bet man, I'd say this, the Supreme court will not overturn this, but I've been surprised before. Yeah, I'm, I'm there with you, but you know, here's the thing. Um, I think most people have no idea what the NLRA is. Uh, most most union people don't, unfortunately, know what the NLRB does. Uh, obviously, the act and the board very different. Um, this is, should be an education process for for working people to understand that this could be taken away. And you, you may be right; the court may not do it this time or go this far or or any of that. But I think this is an education opportunity to explain exactly what the NLRA is and what the what the board part of the NLRA does. I, I think that's important. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, the National Labor Relations Act from 1935 is sort of the premier uh, federal legislation that protects union rights, not only union rights, but just worker rights generally uh, throughout the United mm -hmm. States. So uh, it, you know, we you know, talking about calling balls and strikes. Uh, the NLRB is supposed to be doing that. And generally they do. Uh, with regard to union activity, because as you well know, corporate America is very good at union busting and trying to prevent people from performing unions. And the NLRB will often come in under using the National Labor Relations Act and say, you know, sorry, they've got to have, you know, a fair right to vote. They've got to have a fair right to assemble. I mean, they they were really in the weeds on the rights to form unions and then not only the right to form unions, but how unions function after that. And for those of us who are not in unions, the National Labor Relations Board still has a very powerful influence on our workplace because they can um, uh, they can govern the right to to engage in what we call concerted activity. So whether that's that's you know union activity or just standing up for your rights outside of a union, the National Labor Relations Act protects those. So you it would be illegal to fire you, let's say, for standing up and saying, hey, you know, there are unsafe working conditions here. Or hey, I think there's uh, illegal pay practices happening in this in this organization. Those sorts of things are protected by the National Labor Relations Act uh, through the National Labor Relations Board. So it really has uh, you know a long-reaching impact for all of us in the workplace. Yeah, and and it's one of those things where I think the education process is very important because again, most people don't know what it is. And the reason I think this is important is if it is taken away, something to be angry about because. The history of the NLRA is kind of important. My view is it was a peace treaty to get my grandparents' generation from literally tearing this country apart because they were being so badly abused. Um, but I'm curious, your, your thought of the history. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, if you know, you talk about what would happen if we got rid of the National Labor Relations Board, going back to what it was like before, you know, before that was enacted, uh, you know, the, the practices were just horrendous, right? The worker abuse was open. It was flagrant. It was uh, appalling. And so, you know, the National Labor Relations Board was really put in place to, as you say, to prevent people in the going to the streets with pitchforks because that's where things were headed. And so the act has a long history of trying to maintain labor relations. You know, sometimes it's done better than others, uh, but to maintain labor relations between management and employees, uh, whether they're unionized or not. So if if, you know, Starbucks and uh, SpaceX and Amazon and Trader Joe's, if they get their way and this is overturned, do you do you think that this is something that, you know, the American workers just take? Does it make them more militant? Do we see a much more activist militant labor movement? Uh, any any thoughts on where this could potentially lead? Yeah, it's a great question. I think we could see some more, much more activist, uh, much more, you know, bare knuckles kinds of uh, confrontations, maybe literally, you know, because without the National Labor Relations Board, I mean, it's it it's going to be the Wild West. I mean, they're very few. I mean, there are some agencies, but there are no agencies that have that kind of direct role in regulating union activity and other concerted worker activities. So without that protection, which is what that lawsuit aims to do, right? If they, if they, if they 
if they are successful in getting this to the Supreme Court and getting it overturned, then that agency's gone. Now there could be an, you know, a, a, an attempt to try to reconstitute it, but it's not going to look like what it looks like now. No, and look, you know, judging on what happens in Washington today, I have right. no yeah. faith that anything will replace it. Right. So, you know, to, to follow up on that, you know, I get that, you know, if, if the NLRA goes away or is unconstitutional for future workers organizing, uh, I get, you know, that that would throw that completely in the cast. But what about people who've, who've been in legacy contracts and, 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 have had unions there like me my entire work life. Right. No, it's gonna affect that too, right? Because the national, if it's gone, then the the regulatory agency that enforces those agreements, that enforces your ability to, to, to continue to participate in union, not not just like you said, just in, not only for people for in future, you know, union organizing efforts, it would directly impact people today in the workplace. I mean, the very next day you would see changes and it would endanger union ability to enforce, uh, you know, longstanding agreements. Now you as an employment side or an employment lawyer, uh, I'm sure you deal with a lot of people being fired and a lot of situations of at will employment. For me, I tell people you, you join a union so that you have a contract. So you have due process so that you don't get you know fired for no reason whatsoever. Uh, that's one thing, but wages, hours, conditions, all of that very important. Um, to have that go away would throw employment law, law in this country, I think, completely into chaos. So do you think that there's a way that they they rule on this that could you know just lessen it a little bit where you still have uh, all of this stuff in place, but they don't really have any power? Yeah, they could. Uh, I mean, we could, they could do some kind of creative uh, ruling that would, as you point out, essentially gut the agency without getting rid of it completely, you know, because what this lawsuit you know, is aiming at us at the structure of the agency. They're claiming that it is unconstitutional in the way that the judges are appointed and then overseen. So, you know, they could say, the court could say, well, you know, the agency can remain, but, you know, these judges under these certain, under these conditions, uh, uh, you know, don't have enforcement power or don't have significant enforcement power. So then you'd have an agency that was, you know, on the books, but essentially toothless. Now, on the bigger picture for me, and again, you're you're the lawyer here. I'm just a guy who reads a little bit. Um, you know, I keep saying that this court and a, and a lot of the right wing of this country wants to move us back to the Lochner era, where if you were hungry enough and desperate enough to work in deplorable conditions for poverty wages, that was your liberty. It was your freedom. <laughs> and I'm hearing those messages again. Now, only instead of liberty of contract, it's now freedom, uh, because, you know, evidently that's the buzzword that they they use most often. Uh, do you see that as part of this? Uh, do you see the same thing I'm seeing? Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, that's been the longstanding, you know, we're, uh, we're, we want you workers to be free, right? Like a right to work state, right? We want you to be able to make your own choices. Uh, when what the real impact of that is, is it blunts workers ability to act in a collective fashion. So, uh, so absolutely. I think you're exactly right. But looking at this, and, and and I know I have a lot of friends who go, "Well, that couldn't happen here." Uh, reality is, is you know, one change of the law like this, potentially we're right back to the you know the good old days of uh, the '80s and '90s, and not the 1980s and '90s. Yeah, I, I mean, it. it, it uh, I mean, we saw what happened to Roe, right? I mean, the court was willing to overturn you know upend decades of longstanding precedent, including the court's own precedent. And we've seen the chaos, chaos that that has caused on, on the state level. And so absolutely, with the stroke of a pen, I mean, this Supreme Court could, you know, wipe the NLRB off the map. And then you're right, we are back to, you know, we are back to the Lochner era. We're back to workers having very few protections, except those that they extract with extreme pain, both to themselves and to the economy at large. So the last line of questioning I've got for you, because I, again, I want to hammer on the fact that this is this is an important law that I don't think many people, most working people know even exists. Uh, and, and I believe we should be defending this at every opportunity and strengthening. Look, over the last 89 years, there's been an ossification process where our rights have been diminished slowly over time. I would like to see you know something like the PRO Act passed. Uh, I'd like to see Taft-Hartley overturned. I'd like to see a lot of things. Uh, but at least holding on to the little bit that we have is, I think, important as a starting point. Or do you think just chucking the whole thing and and potentially starting over? 
uh, and you're starting over in a way that's beneficial to workers. Um, yes. No, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, if they get what they want, uh, there's I, I, had, I had a union buddy of mine tell me, well, this would be a good thing. It'd make people wake up and and and, and start fighting for something. Kind of a libertarian view, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could certainly hope for that. I mean, I do think it would be a rude awakening to a lot of people, uh, as you point out. I mean, not only people in unions, but people who are not in unions. Like right now, if you're at a workplace, you're protected if you go on Facebook and raise an issue about your, your workplace and working conditions and, you know, discrimination and those, those sorts of important issues in the workplace. You're protected by the National Labor Relations Act. If that goes away, then Again, it's the Wild West. You can't post that. I mean, you, you could, but you could be fired legally. Uh, you're not going to be able to have you know, a referee in there to help with unionizing efforts. I mean, it would be a, a rude awakening. A lot of people would notice, even if they're not aware of the law right now, I think you're right. Most people are not. Uh, they would be a, become aware pretty quickly once that law is absent and corporate America is able to you know, behave as it wants to without restraint. Let me follow up on that for a second because you, you can grab my attention. Uh, you know, posting something on social media can get you fired. Sure. In an environment where you don't have a contract and due process. If you're an at-will employee, you can be fired for, well, posting something on social media or no reason at all. Yeah. I mean, you would still have some, you know, protections of federal uh, anti-discrimination law, but those, you know, have their own limitations. Uh, and those laws don't uh, impact you know, again, workers' rights to act collectively in any fashion in the workplace. So absolutely, if you now if you post something on social media about your workplace conditions, that's protected. If you're a union or not, under the National Labor Relations Act, National Labor Re Relations Act goes away, then you can post that and you're right. You can be, you can be legally fired uh, and, you know, we lose union mm -hmm. rights like right now, right? If you're under most collective bargaining agreements, if, you know, if you're there, some disciplinary action is proposed against you at work, you have a right to have a union rep with you. That doesn't exist for most employees. If you're not in a union, you can't, we get, get these calls all the time. You're not entitled in most instances to bring your lawyer. You're not entitled to any kind of representation if you're not in the union. So those important rights would go away and there would be nothing to replace them unless there was another National Labor Relations Act, but there'd be nothing in, in other, uh, uh, in other, you know, um, institutions or other federal agencies that would protect you in that way. Well, I mean, this could throw employment in, into chaos. The hope is uh, this this just gets thrown into the trash heap of history. But it's interesting that they're trying. Uh, Tom, I appreciate you sharing some thoughts, sharing your expertise. Hope folks will check out the podcast, the Tom Spiegel, uh, the Spiegel Law Firm podcast. We'll get links out on social media, how you can take a look at that. Tom Spiegel, appreciate the time. Great. Thanks for having me on, Rick. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, do you think the Roberts court, Mr. Balls and Strikes, do you think they go and overturn this? I got to tell you, you know, that this court, scary stuff. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Right back. Hey, this is Ken Casey from the Dropkick Murphys, and you're listening to the Rick Smith Show. We are here in our warehouse at HireWire. We manufacture batteries for solar energy and other renewables. These are going to go into solar lighting. These are also going to go into emergency backup. Thanks to Joe Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, we'll be doubling the number of good jobs in the next month or so. He's bringing manufacturing jobs back to America and creating a domestic supply chain, which means lower costs for families like mine. It's not just a paycheck. It's providing for your family. It's retirement. It's access to quality health care. It's everything. It takes a lot to raise a family. A good job, a good salary, and some patience. A lot of people my age are drowning in college debt, but I chose a different path. I'm a member of the IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. I work hard for my job, and I love what I do. I had a lot of choices for my future, but I made the best choice for my family. IBEW, the right choice. So, you know, we've been talking about the Heritage Foundation and their Project 2025 uh, in combination with Donald Trump's want to use something called Schedule F. And, and there's a lot of stuff here and we're going to get to it. But the idea, as I remember and as I've talked about, is Trump was going to use this Schedule F to fire at anyone in the federal government who isn't sufficiently loyal. And the Heritage Foundation would properly vet sufficiently loyal folks to take those jobs, thus making patronage great again. 
Uh, now the Biden administration kind of threw a little wrench into that plan. Uh, as last week, the Office of Personnel Management, they have uh, moved on, a, I guess, a rule that's going to uh, preempt this. And I'm not quite sure how this is going to work. And that's why I've asked Jackie Simon to come talk with us. Uh, she's the director of public policy with the American Federation of Government Employees, AFGE, AFGE.org, the website, if you want to take a look at their work. Uh, Jackie, thanks, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me. So let's start with what is uh, what is this uh, the Schedule F that we doth hear of? Well, um, I think that Schedule F, all we really know about Schedule F per se is the executive order that Donald Trump issued right at the very end of his uh, first term. Let's hope it's his only term. Um, and it never really got off the ground because it happened so late. It was in October, right before the election. Um, and after the election, of course, uh, you know, the agencies didn't bother putting together their lists. But the kind of lists that they were supposed to put together were uh, positions that were in any way connected to carrying out policy. And the only agency that actually compiled a list that uh, was able to be you know, looked at by other people was the Office of Management and Budget, which, of course, is an arm of the White House. And if you use what they did as a guide, um, no surprise to anyone, they had a very expansive concept of uh, being involved in policy. And, of, you know, it involved people who actually wrote regulations, but also the administrative assistant who might do the uh, typing and document preparation or somebody who might be copying documents, anybody who touched anything that was connected to policy. And Someone you know we might the trash that the the the, the, the sure. policy papers were in. <laughs> well, those are all contractors, but in any case, uh, yes. And so that gives you a sense. Um, so in that, ca if that happens government wide, which we have every reason to expect it will, uh, these lists will be very expansive, and the and the number tens of thousands won't begin to capture the number of jobs that would be affected by this schedule. F. And the intention would be to uh, to switch these jobs over to Schedule F. They would no longer be competitive service jobs. They'd become Schedule F jobs. And once they became Schedule F jobs, as you just said, they're, you know, you become an at-will employee. You can be hired and fired at will for no reason or any reason. And we know, of course, the reason for firing is going to be not poor performance, but failure to adhere to the Trump agenda. And failure to kiss up to dear leader, you know, ha heaven forbid you write something on, on social media that that dear leader doesn't like. And this is this should scare everyone, even the red hats who support Trump, because this kind of authoritarian policy is bad for all working people. Well, that's true. Um, I mean, I. I can I can go two ways from here. I can talk about other things that are that are Schedule F adjacent and almost as bad as Schedule F that they're also going to do, or I can talk about this new regulation that the Biden administration just put out. Which which direction you want to well, go? Tell me what what Biden did because you know as I understand they've they've thwarted this for now. But if Trump becomes president, I have no faith that that Trump is going to. Uh, adhere to the, this policy that they will eventually overturn it and go the way they want. So, uh, what am I missing here? Well, you sort of uh, you went to the end right away. Um, so, I think that it will certainly slow down the implementation of uh, Schedule F. Got to make a distinction in the federal government and really at everywhere between the the status of a position and the status of the person that holds that position or wants to hold that position. And so what this Biden uh, regulation does is protect people who are already in those positions. If you've already been hired through the competitive service and you have all the rights, the, the due process rights, the civil service rights uh, that, uh, that go along with a competitive service position, it says you can't take those away just unilaterally. You can't declare uh, the incumbent of, an, of a new Schedule F position to be uh, subject to all the rules and regulations that will, will go along with Schedule F. And you, as you pointed out, it will be challenged immediately. It'll be rescinded. Um, 
but when, once they start actually firing people uh, on, on these specious grounds, these political grounds or whatever, uh, they won't even need it. Won't it? Won't just be adherence to uh, to uh, President Trump's policies. I mean, as bad as that is, I think that we should all prepare ourselves for uh, people who aren't um, white, um, of the preferred religion, of the preferred gender, etc having their employment threatened as well. Right. I mean, this is patronage at its, at its worst. But, you know, you know, my my fear is, and I've had this conversation a couple of times already, is that the Heritage Foundation is doing their due diligence in vetting people, and they've identified every probably every position in our government that they want to put their loyalists into who are going to be extremely competent. Uh, they're not going to be just, hey, Uncle Joe's got a nephew who needs a job. These are going to be people who are extremely competent, and their goal is going to be to destroy that agency, not to do the work of the people, but to do the work of corporate America, thus privatizing and profitizing our government. Well, you may be right, but there are a few evil geniuses out there, um, people who really are competent and would know what they were doing, trying to dismantle an agency or a program and, and really create chaos and, and, and screw the whole thing up. Um, in my experience, a lot of these people are idiots and um, they, which you know, is, like, hold on, which is worse. Uh, the, the, the bumbling idiot who, you know, is the, the, the nephew of, of uncle Bill uh, or the person who really knows what they want and has an ax to grind against, against that, which, which person's worse? Well, I think it depends on the context. Um, a, a lot of people, you know, thanked God on a daily basis that Trump was such a bumbling idiot and that he was incapable of running the government in any coherent way or, you know, it, that he was not really able to uh, affect all the kinds of changes he, he wanted to change, to affect. There's that. But then, you know, there are agencies where, uh, you know, who's in a position is a, is a life or death um, proposition. Community in healthcare, um, in you know, working for for example in FEMA, uh, working in the prisons, working in border patrol, any kind of law enforcement, um, you know, if if you've got incompetence in some of these jobs, uh, people could die. I mean, there's there's all kinds of, you know, somebody who's in Consumer Product Safety Commission um, at the EPA, having to do with uh, you know trying to protect the the air we breathe the water we drink, et cetera. If you have incompetence in those kind of jobs, uh, the, the consequences can, can be life or death, not just for a few people, but for millions of people. So, you know, that part is scary if they had, if they had truly, uh, truly incompetent people. Um, some of these, you know, the politicals, I, I think it's really kind of a 50-50. I would say that from from the last uh, Trump administration, there were uh, there were like we said e evil geniuses who knew exactly what they wanted to do and were very effective at doing it, and there were others who were like, "Where am I? What's going on?" You know, they only got the, and we found out later they got the job because they organized a rally or something, yeah. and and they, they were wholly awesome. incompetent. <laughs> no, but so, here's the thing, and this is where it'll be a mix. I think the difference in this time around is uh, I don't think the people, the, the money people, the think tank world, I don't think all of those groups bought that Trump was going to win. I don't think they thought he was going to win. And I didn't I don't think they were sufficiently crazy enough yet. Uh, I think from you know, 2015, 16 to now, I think the Heritage Foundation and all of the, you know, the state policy network think tanks and all of these places have gone completely off the deep end. And I think they're they they want to seize this opportunity and are putting the you know billions of dollars in resources into into taking this over. All true, um, but some I mean maybe I'm just you know tr being Pollyannish about this. Believe me, I'm expecting the worst if Trump wins. There's no question about it. Federal employees will be harmed. Um, the administration will be absolutely focused on. Um, inflicting as much harm on federal employees as they possibly can. 
across the board, economic harm and harm in terms of their rights, harm in terms of their ability to carry out their, their jobs, the missions of their agencies, harm in terms of national security, or even border security, every kind of security, clean air, clean water, safe food, you know, you name it. Across the board, every everything and everybody will be worse off. And the question is, will there be enough people who are uh, who want a Trump administration political job on their resume um, and are competent uh, who will who will want these kind of jobs. I mean, there are political appointments that are prestigious, and then there are these low level jobs that aren't particularly prestigious. And uh, and the fallout, if if all goes, you know, according to expectations that the pendulum will swing at some point, America will wake up. Uh, you know, that will be a stain on their on their resumes, on their career, on their lives. And so I think that a lot of people, competent people, intelligent people might think twice about taking one of these jobs. So, again, it comes back to the question I asked a minute ago, which is worse. Uh, the competent you know, people who have an axe to grind who are going to go in there and, and do the devil's work or the the totally bumbling incompetent who is going to, well, screw everything up. And thus, ultimately, the kind of the same result where your know, government is broken and corporations uh, rule the day. Well, the smart ones are, are more dangerous in policy roles, that's for sure. Um, in carrying out the policy, uh, you know, <laughs> that's that's a toss up. It, it's gonna be a nightmare. Let's just, let, I, I, I hate thinking about it, but everybody wants to talk about Schedule F, but uh, you know, we got we got to really work to make sure that never happens. And that's it. So as you're talking to your members, you know, clearly this has got to be something that's on that weighs on their minds because, you know, the, you know, I know a lot of federal employees and the one thing they talk about is, you know, they have some bit of security. They're they're not at will employees. They're, they The only way they can be fired is through due process. So now throwing this at will kind of scenario in there, are you getting any responses from people? Well, that was that's a good segue into the other subject I wanted to talk about. And that is, um, although there's a lot of focus on Schedule F, the it's the rest of the civil service that uh is really in danger of being dismantled and harmed in a trump administration and unfortunately there are a lot of democratic lawmakers who go along with some of these ideas and that is uh to relax or reform or whatever word they want to use the competitive service they want to make it easier to hire and easier to fire all federal employees and their favorite way to describe the civil service system is to call it broken, and we need to fix it. It's broken. The hiring system's broken. It's too hard to fire a federal employee. And so you've got all these people who, you know, uh, are, you've got these sort of bipartisan groups that'll come together and say, here we have a bipartisan proposal for civil service reform. And what they all are are weakening these civil service protections that you just talked about that that provide a certain amount of uh, due process if somebody you know is accused of misconduct or poor performance or something like that you get to go to a third party a neutral third party and they management has to show its evidence and the worker has his or her evidence and and a, a neutral will decide whether or not there's enough evidence to justify whatever it is that management wants to do fire you discipline you, et cetera. Right. That's what they want to not a hundred percent get rid of, but weaken to the point that it's uh, it, workers will not be able to exercise the, the, you know, very, very weak rights that they'll have when this is all said and done. And the other thing they want to do is completely rewrite the pay system. And that's as dangerous as anything uh, having to do with Schedule F, because not only do they will, will they want to decide who gets a pay raise and um, you know how big the pay raise is, but also in Project 2025, one of the worst sentences in the whole thing for federal employees. Um, one of the things that you just you've been talking about is that uh, they will elevate performance as uh, as a, a a factor or a criterion for whether you keep your job, whether you get a pay raise, whether you get a promotion, all those kinds of things. And they are very explicit that uh, carrying out the political agenda of the president 
will be an important element in your performance evaluation. So that politicizes every job in the entire federal government, not just Schedule F, not just the higher level policy making, but every job. And that allow, and then that combined with these uh, weakened um, uh, appeal rights, and of course the they have no trouble abrogating the collective bargaining agreement. They toss that in the trash can and say, you know, just we're, we're not real interested in that. And so even outside of the collective bargaining agreement, those appeal rights will, will be almost impossible for workers to access and, and use. So it's the whole enchilada. It's not just the policy making jobs. It's the whole federal civil service. So it's even worse than I, I've been saying it is. It's it's this and then a whole lot more, uh, which again is why I'm, I'm hoping uh, come November that we don't have to we don't have to think about this. Uh, mm -hmm. And the person who's pushing this kind of uh, making patronage great agenda, um, maybe we don't put him back into office. Uh, so so last question I've got for you outside of uh, obviously voting a, you know, a particular way in November. You know, what can people do to to let elected leaders know that, hey, we, we value our public servants. We value our, our government employees. Maybe we should maybe I don't know, treat them better. Yeah. I mean, I think that when um, when people who aren't federal employees uh, talk to lawmakers or, or, or uh, politicians who'd like to become a lawmaker, um, I think that, you know, obviously they've got their own issues, too. But uh, everybody has skin in the game of an effective government. Yeah. Um, everybody's breathing the same air. Everybody's drinking the same water. Uh, you know, everybody is buying the same products um, at the at the store. We want safe food. We want safe products. We want a, a, an effective national defense. And so the people who provide all of that really should be insulated from politics. I'm right there with you, Jackie Simon. I appreciate you taking some time for us, uh, filling us in on the the, the facts. Uh, thanks so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, J Jackie Simon, AFGE Director of Public Policy. Check out their website, afge.org. Uh, look, you know, I, I've said this a million times. I don't want politics in our in our in our governance. Uh, I want boring bureaucrats doing the jobs that they're trained and and spent their lives working towards. I want the best people in those jobs. I want them to have security rights. Uh, but, you know, the reality is you can fire a federal employee. You just got to do it the right way. Just like you can throw somebody in jail. You just got to do it the right way. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show dot com. Going to take a quick break. Right back. Stick around. You're listening to the Rick Smith Show. We're working people. The talk. I've been driving buses for five years and my day-to-day -day routine is I wake up a little earlier than most people. I get on a bus, I go out, I pick up some students and make sure they get to school nice and safe. Here in Fairbanks, Alaska, that can be a challenge because of the winter weather and the icy roads. But I love the job. So the Teamsters are great. They provide us a lot of protections. They've always taken care of their people, made sure that our jobs were secure. We didn't have to worry about whether or not we'd have a job from day to day. Uh, and that's amazing because before we'd be working four, six, eight hours a day and only earning minimum wage was real difficult to make a living. And then the Teamsters pushed the law so we make something we can live off of and not have to have a second job. What absolutely gives me peace of mind, the, the union membership allows me to focus on this job without having to worry about whether or not my family is going to be taken care of. I'm Andrew Case and I'm proud to be Teamsters Local 959. So Alec is back at the American Legislative Exchange Council. In case you don't know, uh, they are a corporate shill group. Uh, their job to heavily lobby Congress, uh, to heavily lobby state legislators, uh, to get them to pass bad anti-worker, pro-corporate legislation. Uh, they, they do a really great job of, of whining and dining and doing your local legislators' work possibly. Uh, I love the I love finding those model bills that Alec puts out, you know, especially here in Pennsylvania, where I found a couple of them where you you could put their model legislation and your legislators bill next to each other. And they're eerily familiar, familiar. Um, some would argue uh, identical. In fact, there was that case in Florida where I think it was a, I think it was a woman legislator um, 
doesn't matter. But I think that was the, this woman put in a piece of legislation with Alex's name still on it. Didn't even bother to put her name on it, which I guess honest, I give her credit, maybe. Uh, but they're back and there's more model legislation that could be banging around state houses uh, in your neck of the woods. As labor has seen an uptick in support, as the American public is going, hey, something's not quite right. We've got all these billionaires. We, there's all this wealth. We're the wealthiest country in the history of civilization at its wealthiest moment. And yet I'm still struggling. Uh, we still have hungry children. We've got homeless vets. We've got crumbling cities. We got work to do. Um, how is it that this happens? Well, again, I go back to my high school government teacher. Uh, government decides who gets what. And what we've been deciding for a very long time is the very wealthy and corporations get what they want. And the rest of us, well, we get the the bird. <laughs> I, I you know, that's the best I can come up with. We we get the shaft, you know, and and the the Alec legislation again not new. This is stuff that they've been the poison they've been pushing for a very long time. Uh, the the right to work stuff that they've been pushing and has been passed in twenty six states across this country. You know, pushing you know for the the whole free rider thing. Um, that's still heavily on the agenda. Uh, also the. Uh, the fact that they want to have this, I, I, what I love is their, their, their language, uh, like right to work, right to work sounds fabulous. We should all, we should all have a right to work, right? We should all have that right. When the reality is there's no rights. I think Dr. King said it best. There are no rights and there's no work. It's just a way to screw people out of, out of their wages. Uh, they're also pushing this thing called the Paycheck Protection Act. <laughs> uh, this, this again, very decept, dece deceitful, uh, deceptive. Uh, unions and members uh, have a system set up, you know, check off uh, where you, your dues come out of your paycheck every month. Mine does. Um, you know, just. It makes it so much easier for members to just go, hey, every the first of every month, you know, my dues are going to come out because, yeah. well, this Paycheck Protection Act. Remember, they're protecting your paycheck. Uh, it would it would make it illegal for employers to uh, to do this. It would prohibit automatic deductions. Now, uh, they're still going to allow for, like the United Way and for, uh, you know, for, you know, obviously the NRA or whatever. Uh, but your union? No, 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 no. Uh, and what this is to do is it's to make unions go through the work of collecting dues. Also, they, they're pushing this thing called the Union Recertification Act because, you know, unions don't have enough to do every year. Uh, they should have to go back and hold uh, ballot, secret ballot elections to recertify the union every single year. And and what we found is in places where they've done this, uh, you know, overwhelmingly you know, unions maintain their elections. But it's not about that. It's about wasting dues dollars. It's about wasting workers' money on spinning their wheels so that they're not taking those resources and going out and actually, you guessed it, organizing new workers. Uh, there is a new piece of Alec poison, the Taxpayer Dollars Protection Protect Workers Act. Uh, this was introduced back in 2023. Uh, it is model legislation that blacklists companies from voluntarily recognizing unions uh, when they're getting money from the state. Uh, Georgia right now is pushing this through their legislature. So if, you know, say, you know, a battery, EV battery plant is being built uh, down in Georgia and the auto workers go down to that, that, that company and go, hey, you got an agreement with Ford or GM or any of them, uh, recognize this and we'll, we'll start, you know, the members, the workers want it. Uh, there can be labor peace um, and the employer can recognize voluntarily. And the, the union and the company can come to agree, an agreement voluntarily, decide to work together, don't have to butt heads. No, no. In, in, in places that pass this Taxpayer Dollars Protect Workers Act, uh, that would be illegal. And remember, the party of smaller, less intrusive government, the party of, you know, get your government out of my, you know, you know whatever, uh, they 
they would put government right in between workers and their employer. Because, you know, when you think labor peace, you think government right in the middle of it, uh, especially right wing government. Uh, and also the final one that they're pushing through is this labor peace agreement um, that basically would prevent local governments uh, from requiring employers to agree that they won't interfere in union elections. Uh, so under the guise of labor peace, uh, they're saying, no, you have to go crush those unions. Let that sink in. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. If you miss any portion of the program, grab the podcast. And as always, thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick Rick at rick at thericksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.